Uh, it's great to speak here and be in Slovenia. Um, I'm just going to jump right in. Today I'm going to discuss how metagenomic research uh, can advance our understanding of infection and autoimmunity. The term metagenomics refers to the collective genomes of different microorganisms. And that's what I'm going to be discussing today, how in the human body, many different microbial genomes can combine to cause a disease state. For example, this chart shows the composition of three important phyla that persist in the skin. But the blue bars correspond, uh, show the composition of the phyla in healthy skin, whereas the red bars show the composition of uh, the phyla as detected in 13 samples taken from individuals with psoriatic lesions. So clearly the communities of bacteria in healthy and psoriatic skin are very different. So how are these bacteria detected? Well, instead of just using cultivation techniques to standard cultivation methods to find the bacteria, the researchers used 16S RNA sequencing. They identified over 1,925 clones cores in, in the skin. And uh, similar techniques, these are techniques that also rely on identifying bacteria by characterizing their DNA, such as shotgun sequencing, pyro sequencing, and single cell sampling are revolutionizing the field of microbiology right now, and they're actually opening a door to a tremendous era of discovery. Uh, for example, in the psoriasis study, 84 of the clones likely represented novel species never before known to persist in the skin. And these tools allow us to study microbes in the tissues in which they persist. So over the past few years, thanks to these molecular tools, there have been so many novel microbes discovered in the human body, and in fact, there have been so many that we now realize that just a fraction of these microbes can be successfully cultured if we were only use standard lab, uh, laboratory methods. So to uh, emphasize my point, I put together this highly scientific illustration. And um, this is, for example, uh, according to current NIH estimates, how many microbes you likely see here if we just use standard laboratory tests to look at this group of hypothetical rascals. So, you can understand how, before the advent of molecular technology, when all these guys in the background were not detectable, the notion that the human body was relatively sterile became commonplace. But today, we realize that there are thousands more genomes in Homo sapiens, and actually most of them have yet to even be named and characterized. Well, that's why the NIH is currently running the Human Microbiome Project, and it's a correlate to the Human Genome Project where they are funding essentially the top genomic centers in the country to continue studying the differences in uh, populations between bacteria and other microbes in health and disease. Well, with this in mind, it's entirely possible that in autoimmune disease, the antibodies are not being created in response to self, but are instead being produced in response to these pathogens. Well, even tissues with the highest reputation for sterility, such as, let's say, the amniotic fluid, are actually filled with a diversity of bacteria. Um, in 2008, DiGiulio and Relman at Stanford published a study showing the presence of 18 different bacterial taxa in the amniotic fluid. You can see here that the, um, on the x-axis, that uh, number of bacteria was inversely correlated with length of pregnancy. And the positive predictive value, uh, positive predictive value of PCR for preterm delivery was 100%, which is a number not even heard of in science. So clearly, we're not just dealing anymore with HHV6 or chlamydia pneumoniae, but hundreds and hundreds of other microbes. And uh, these microbes, they can persist in the blood and inside the cells of the immune system. For example, in patients with gastric ulcer disease, um, H. pylori, it doesn't just persist in the cells of the gastric mucosa, it also persists in peripheral blood. Well, in this context, how does chronic inflammatory disease appear to develop? Well, we can examine this question at the molecular level. And key to the process is that chronic bacteria and viruses can alter expression of the body's metabolites. Now take, for example, the vi vitamin D receptor, or VDR. It's a type 1 nuclear receptor. Well, it turns out that viruses, like Epstein-Barr virus, and bacteria, like Mycobacterium tuberculosis, have evolved to survive in the same fashion, and that's by slowing activity of the VDR. Um, for example, uh, MTB downregulates VDR activity by about a factor of 3.3, and this slide shows VDR activity being downregulated uh, actually by almost a factor of 30 in the longer-lasting cell lines of B cells infected with EBV. So um, basically, um, 
you might ask, why the VDR? Well, colloquially, uh, colloquially speaking, the VDR serves as a gatekeeper to the innate immune response. So it expresses uh, catholicidin, it expresses these key endogenous antimicrobials that the body needs in order to target intracellular pathogens. Uh, catholicidin, the beta defensins, it also expresses toll-like receptor 2. In addition to that, it expresses at least 913 genes, many connected to autoimmune diseases and cancers. So by dysregulating and slowing the VDR, Epstein-Barr virus and mycobacterium tuberculosis have actually evolved to slow the body's very defense mechanisms that would otherwise be actively working to render them dead. And uh, note that uh, HIV persists in the same fashion. It completely overtakes the VDR in order to transcribe its own genome. And uh, Borrelia does as well, um, downregulating live Borrelia. It downregulates the receptor by about a factor of 50, lice by about a factor of 8. So this is such a logical survival mechanism on the part of these microbes that it's almost certain that other less well-studied microbes have also evolved to slow VDR activity or the activity of other receptors involved in controlling the immune response. Well, these persistence mechanisms result in a snowball effect. When the immune system, you know, when, when, it's, it, when a person, the immune system slows and a person acquires one pathogen, then it becomes easier for them to acquire yet another pathogen, and the immune system then acquires yet another pathogen, and these pathogens each slow the immune system in turn. And the pathogens can be viral, fungal, bacterial, and so on and so on. And this process is referred to as successive infection. In the context of successive infection, an inflammatory disease state appears to result from the combined pathogenicity of the sum of microbes that any one person accumulates over the course of a lifetime. And as human genes are upregulated or downregulated by components of these microbes, the human body shifts further and further away from its natural state of homeostasis. And infected cells increasingly struggle to correctly produce human metabolites in the face of all the proteins and enzymes that are being created by the pathogenic microbes. So eventually, people either start to develop an inflammatory diagnosis, such as one of the autoimmune diseases, or they simply begin to present with aches and pains and other symptoms of what is often deemed normal aging. So for example, over the past years, Epstein-Barr virus has been detected in so many different proportions in so many disease states. And here's just a sample of different diseases that have been associated with EBV. And for almost the last century, these results have served as a source of confusion. But if we view them through the lens of metagenomics and in the context of successive infection, they make sense. Epstein-Barr virus is just one component of a mix. In some cases, it could be a precipitating factor for an autoimmune disease condition, or autoimmune condition. Or in other cases, it's just a pathogen that's acquired later on in the disease process when the body's already dealing with the widespread immunosuppression that can be caused by any of the hundreds of the bacterial pathogens that accumulate in the body. And we now understand that by altering nuclear receptor activity, viruses can aid the survival of bacteria and vice versa. Well, with this in mind, a one microbe, one disease paradigm is no longer viable. And treatments for autoimmune disease that aim to eradicate only a single microbe so let's say only our purple friend here, will at best succeed in only reversing a very small part of the overall disease process. Well, it may also not be by uh, accident that the uniqueness with which a patient's autoimmune symptoms develop parallels the incredible diversity of the pathogens that can persist in the human body. And the following wheel shows how truly related chronic diseases are. Each spoke on the wheel rep represents a published study that's shown a significant statistical relationship between patients suffering from one disease and the next, and that is a lot of comorbidity and a lot of symptom overlap. So uh, where do we pick up these pathogens? They're everywhere. They're passed from mother to child during pregnancy, from father to child in the sperm, obviously through familial contact. They're in injectable medicines. They're in donated blood. There are many vectors. Uh, consider for interest, though, I thought this was interesting. A study came out recently. This is um, a group that uh, tested for total bacterial diversity in uh, four brands of cigarettes. And they found uh, 15 different classes of bacteria and a wide range of pathogenic microorganisms in every single cigarette tested, even the cools. Finally, and I want to stress this, the model of successive infection has great implications for the way autoimmune disease should be treated. 
If microbes, both bacterial and viral, are driving the autoimmune disease state, then treatments that suppress the immune response can at best succeed in achieving short-term palliation. They offer temporary relief by slowing the inflammation that would otherwise be generated if the immune system were actually targeting the pathogens. But instead, the pathogens remain alive and they're able to proliferate and they cause the person to become sicker over the long term. Well, this being said, I work with a nonprofit autoimmunity research foundation. And we, over the last six years, have been working with a treatment for autoimmune disease that stimulates rather than suppresses the immune response in autoimmune disease. And key to the treatment is the use of a VDR agonist, which, uh, which turns on, re, uh, returns on those components of the innate immune system that I described before that were so important. And um, the results of the treatment thus far are really interesting, at least in my opinion, because we have patients who are not only feeling better, but presenting with objective markers indicating in a significant improvement, significant. And my colleagues will be talking more about the treatment in uh, uh, the vitamin D session and translational medicine session in Hall C, I think at two. And I really highly encourage you to attend. So uh, even when you leave this conference, I hope you keep one important consideration. And honestly, this is a potential paradigm shift that we're dealing here with here in mind when it comes to the immune response in autoimmune disease. Thank you.